It's great to be here, um, and I guess I do need to explain to a certain extent why um, with this? Okay. Um, why I uh, am talking about calligraphy today. Um, this is distinctly not my specialty. I was uh, saying to um, uh, Dr. Mintz just uh, last night that I've taken a total of half an hour, perhaps, of um, lectures on uh, East Asian calligraphy. So this is something that is certainly, um, I, I come, uh, I present it with a certain amount of trepidation because I don't necessarily um, have a deep specialist knowledge in that. I'm hoping, however, that gives you um, a little more um, Andre into asking questions and to exploring this topic with me. Part of the reason <clears throat> why I wanted to do this is um, because of the amazing um, sort of c uh, collection that um, uh, we have at, uh, that here at the Asian Art Museum. And like any good student, I first go to um, see the vision statement, the mission statement. Um, and this uh, reads, as I'm sure you all have uh, inscribed in your hearts, with Asia as our lens and art as our cornerstone, we spark connections across cultures and through time, uh, igniting curiosity, conversation, and creativity. And I was thinking I could essentially replace Asia with calligraphy. Calligraphy also um, is a lens through which we can um, uh, see these connections across cultures through times, and something certainly for me that's ignited a great deal of curiosity, conversation, and creativity. So this is something that um, is a, um, has been an, uh, an important, uh, calligraphy or writing in East Asia has been a, a really um, exciting way to see different aspects of culture that as a more conventional art historian, I mostly work on sculpture and painting, um, it's uh, given me a new perspective on things and I'm hoping I can give you um, some uh, idea of ways that you too can see that. The mission statement goes on um, with the Asia is not one place. The ideas and ideals that we call Asia are countless and diverse. Some of the works we display predate written history. Others were recently created. Many have connections to words from other continents and other millennia. We explore these links, provoking discovery, debate, and inspiration. Again, I think calligraphy works um, uh, very much in the same, uh, same way, except for this particular line, Asia is not one place. One of the interesting things about writing uh, in East Asia uh, is that there's a certain cultural unity, um, uh, a, or the su uh, superficial and I think also deep um, cultural unity that's implied by different um, uh, countries such as um, uh, Korea, uh, China, uh, Japan, Viet Vietnam, using um, uh, the same writing system, or often using the same writing system. And this is something that actually does unify or potentially sets up a series of conversations, not just across um, uh, geographic areas, but also temporally, so from uh, the distant past to the present. And almost any work that we'll, I'll be showing you today is somehow that dialogue, and that's why I, um, uh, I titled my talk in the way I did. So the, um, you're blessed with a, an exceedingly great collection of um, uh, works in general uh, here at the museum, but especially in terms of calligraphy. And uh, you can find um, many pieces that feature the written word primarily, such as in this case, or others that uh, might have, a, say, writing on a painting or on a uh, sculpture or even ceramics, things like that. So one of the things I'd like you to think about, um, I don't think there's much sort of pure calligraphy up in the galleries right now, but if you'll walk through, um, uh, you'll see uh, many places, many objects that have something written on them. And that is not incidental. That's not just some um, little piece on the edge that you're supposed to ignore. That's part of the composition often. If it's a painting, that um, uh, often will tell you something about the function, as we'll see with the bronzes. And so it's something to pay attention to. Now, there's many, um, uh, there's many uh, examples of how uh, the museum has um, uh, shown a continuing institutional interest in calligraphy, whose guru went on 1999 with this incredible sort of presentation. But also you, just ha uh, you have a lot of, um, uh, of workshops, for example, on uh, calligraphy that I was able to spot over the years. But importantly, there's um, uh, two major exhibitions um, uh, that uh, catalogs and exhibitions that uh, relate to calligraphy in recent years. The first would be in 2006 uh, with the AFM Lee collection called The Elegant Gathering. 
And the second is the um, uh, Out of Character exhibition from 2012, six years later. Now, both of these are really um, uh, amazing um, uh, resources, and especially for someone like me enter, uh, trying to enter into the field, not only for understanding collection history, so um, uh, the EA family in the first uh, instance, or Jerry Young, um, uh, who's the uh, collector who um, was behind the uh, objects presented in the um, out of character. These um, uh, people, uh, these uh, donors and uh, collectors, are continuing a very long tradition, uh, and many of the um, people that we'll be looking at um, that are uh, famous as partitioners were also collectors. And so it's a very, um, uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting um, uh, world where m um, many of the people who are, um, who are making what we think of sort of great calligraphic works were also collectors who are looking at other, uh, other works and um, were uh, trying to sort of shape a kind of aesthetics and a sort of sense of the world. If you haven't looked at this, uh, if you, I, I hope that uh, um, uh, you were able to see uh, these exhibitions. Uh, the work with um, uh, Xu Bing uh, was quite uh, famous. Xu Bing uh, is probably first known for his uh, book from the sky, where he did a, um, an enormous project, printed, uh, printed project, where all of these characters, though they look like they might be real um, uh, Chinese characters, don't exist. And so it's a wonderful, um, uh, and it's typical of what Xu Bing does. Um, but what um, uh, he did specifically for um, this um, uh, exhibition, uh, funded by the Ho Family Foundation, was um, uh, to make a, um, a video installation and you can find at least a, an excerpt of this online, uh, and uh, the full uh, version is connected with the catalog associated with this exhibition. Now, of course, even after that, um, the institutional commitment of the um, uh, museum uh, continues. So you have uh, uh, Liu Jianhua, who's I'm not sure if you'd call this calligraphy, but certainly interested in words with this wonderful collected letters exhibition uh, from uh, last year. And so this is. Um, so to talk about calligraphy in the context of the Asian Art Museum is not something I'm adding in, but I think it's fundamental both to the, um, uh, the demonstrated institutional interests and um, the really uh, amazing collection we have. And I, um, I'm lucky that 90% of the objects that I'll be showing you uh, today are from um, uh, either um, uh, the Asian Art Museum collection or collections within, uh, this, uh, er uh, within the area you could uh, go see. Um, and so that's a really exciting thing. So if you're interested in this topic and exploring this more, it's all right here. Now, this is my theoretical schedule. Um, uh, the one absolute is uh, this thing here, the break. I will make sure that we get to that. Um, but <coughs> What I'd like to um, uh, do is uh, start with an introduction, uh, talking about some of the aspects of uh, calligraphy in East Asia. Now, looking at, uh, uh, looking at this uh, yesterday and this morning, I have far too much into the introductory part, and I apologize if I spend a long time on that. Um, unfortunately, well, for better or for worse, there's a lot of sort of basic um, knowledge one has to have to be able to appreciate some of the um, uh, the moves and ideas that calligraphers are manifesting uh, in their work. So I'll spend a good amount of time talking about what is calligraphy, historical scripts in Asia, and uh, basically how it's transmitted. And in the latter part of the, uh, the talk, um, I'd like to uh, focus on some sort of case studies of what I mean by these dialogues. Dialogues uh, first across space and time, and then, um, uh, and then dialogues across what you might call categories, and I'll show what, what I mean by that. So, with that said, I thought we'd start with the basic question of what is calligraphy? Now, <clears throat> if we go back to this piece, um, the uh, character meaning longevity, calligraphy is not a, a there's no hard and fast um, line about where the where simple writing stops and, um, uh, and calligraphy begins. What is calligraphy? Beautiful writing from the Greek. But, so in one sense, I think it's a um, historically inaccurate term. There's, there's no specific term. You might talk about beautiful writing in a pre-modern context, but there's no, no easy one-on-one, um, uh, -on -one, uh, one-to-one translation for the term calligraphy in a pre-modern context. So it's all writing. But there is, I, I think it's safe to say, something that's special writing. 
And that by special, it might be used in a particular religious context. It might be um, uh, the um, way it's written or um, the way it's uh, mounted. I think all of these uh, would come together in, in this. So you have um, a two characters that mean um, uh, in the mist. Um, sorry about that. Um, in, uh, in the mist. And you think about what this would look like if you were write, to write in the mist on a big piece of paper. You're calling attention to the writing itself. You're um, uh, helping, uh, you're, you're saying there's something special about what I'm writing here. And these are seals, um, seals right here, uh, but basically it's signed. So what would this look like if you were to do it yourself? You write a couple of, uh, of words and you sign it. You're saying this is something that you know, we would call art, or um, that it's uh, something special, it's set apart. And in many ways, calligraphy, I think, we can think of as special writing. I'll come back to this um, uh, analogy um, several times, I think, uh, um, while I'm talking today. But I think the uh, connection with poetry might be useful uh, in thinking about that. So what is poetry? And especially if you think of sort of uh, later 20th century, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, free verse, um, it might have meter, it might have rhythm, um, but it doesn't necessarily have uh, rhyme. It, uh, and, but there's certain moves, um, uh, certain ways language is used that might set it apart. Think of a Dylan Thomas poem or something like that, that um, it's almost incantatory in the way that it uh, uses words. People generally don't speak like poets speak, and there's something, um, uh, some different register that's um, uh, being applied there. People generally, they might write, for some re uh, reason, the characters in the mist um, in the course of writing a letter or something like that, but this is setting it apart, making special. And so much of um, what we're calling calligraphy here are those objects that are set apart and uh, given a special um, uh, sort of um, uh, uh, a special identity and a special context. So <clears throat> I think one of the, um, there's many reasons I think it's, it's um, fascinating to, uh, to study calligraphy, even uh, um, East Asian calligraphy, even if you have no interest in, you think you have no interest in East Asian art. One of the ways that it's useful is to think about style, like why certain, um, uh, certain things look the way they do. Another is aesthetics. So if we were saying the term calligraphy means beautiful, uh, beautiful writing, What's beautiful about this? Um, it's um, you know, this heavy line, um, it's sort of almost gouged into the paper, and it's um, something that may not immediately um, be clear what the appeal of this is. Part of what you're often looking at in, uh, in this context is not just the way it looks, but also what it implies about the person character, as in like a Chinese character, and one's character, one's um, sort of uh, inner, um, uh, inner identity or uh, sort of who one is. These are very, uh, that, that pun or that sort of double entendre is, um, uh, is I think very true in East Asia. And certainly it's part of the idea that when you look at this, you have some idea of what, um, uh, what this person is like. This person and this person and this person. They're all very different personalities. And we probably should say personas. These are sort of personas we uh, present to ourselves. If you're old like me, you remember something called letters, um, and uh, people would send you letters that they'd actually write with their hands, um, and that is, um, and there's something even, well, especially now, um, that's magical about that. You get a, a letter from someone uh, who's uh, far away, and even if you've talked to them just on the phone, you know, that something that they've touched, something about their hand. I look at my, just recently looked at a, a letter from my grandmother who's now passed away, and it was this sort of shock of, you know, connecting to the way she um, forms each other's letters. There's, um, and there's a kind of intimacy, um, and, or at least perceived intimacy when looking at this. And back to this notion of aesthetics, especially um, uh, more contemporary um, uh, calligraphy and um, calligraphy from, um, uh, from uh, Japan, often from a Chinese perspective, is bad writing. You know, this is kind of looks like someone who might have been maybe a little drunk or just not paying much attention or just has bad penmanship. My dad was a lawyer. Um, lawyers are uh, famous for their bad, uh, bad writing along with doctors. Um, and so, you know, someone scribbled this down. 
But this is a highly valued piece of, uh, piece of work. Why is that? Well, this is a great opportunity uh, to be thinking, uh, to um, take one of our basic art historical um, sort of questions about why does this look the way uh, it does? Why do people value this? Um, and what was it uh, about the particular moment that, uh, that makes um, the aesthetics of this line of this character, of this person's character, all coming together to make this special. So I'll point to uh, more um, uh, reasons for that as we go forward. So just to th um, be thinking about, uh, this, uh, continue to think of the status of writing in East Asia, um, I, I want to just remind us that um, writing is an everyday art. And I put art in scare quotes because, um, again, what's the term that I might be trying to use in a pre-modern context for art? Well. There's writing and writing. You know, you can use the same term for what a clerk in a, um, a bureaucracy might write and what some fam now famous calligrapher might write, and it's it's all writing. And you can see some of that, um, some of that shift when you look at a piece like this. This is uh, one of the um, great works of Jap uh, Japanese calligraphy in the uh, collection um, that is um, attributed to Karasumaru Mitsuhiro, uh, this man uh, here. Now, um, he's a, uh, one of the um, most famous uh, calligraphers of the, say, 17th century in, uh, in Japan. And it's a letter. Again, um, the aesthetics might be somewhat uh, hard to uh, understand, except uh, I think there's a, there's a sort of um, be beauty and uh, kind of rhythm and kind of musicality to this, um, as we see. But I think when we look at this, and this is one of the um, great advantages of being here rather than, say, me teaching a class in Ann Arbor, is um, you get to see what goes around it, the framing. I remember seeing a lot of Western art paintings for the first time with these elaborate gilt frames and you know, carved things like that, and be very sh sort of surprised um, by how much that changes the character of it. We should always pay attention to the mounting, to the, sort of, uh, the context for it. What happens when we go from here to here? Well, um, when, we, when we take into account this uh, larger context, this is a letter, uh, basically an informal letter, not something that was meant to be in a museum in, what, 400 years later, um, but rather something that uh, was um, to communicate. And part of that communication is content, part of the communication, just like any, uh, any sort of handwritten letter in the uh, sort of present day, is a communication of feeling, I suppose. But once you mount it um, in this way, then you're saying you're setting it apart, making it special. And this is another place where you have a kind of um, a special writing or calligraphy. And what does that do? Well, it makes you look a little closer. Instead of just sort of um, looking at for it purely for its content or, or, going, uh, or um, skimming, uh, skimming through to um, just another letter, this then calls you to, uh, to spend time with it. And one of the things I think is, uh, I certainly feel this with my undergraduates who don't speak any, um, say, read, read any Chinese or anything like that, or Japanese, they might come and spend time, and what can you see? What can you uh, find out? And that context of beautiful writing or writing that's special um, uh, helps uh, to you pay attention to that. Now that said, Calligraphy is, uh, or the writing, is a very everyday thing, um, the, at least for um, elites in, uh, in East Asia. You, most of, a lot of your job will be writing. You know, most of it's now email, alas. Um, but um, if, well, I'm, sh I'm sure there's going to be a museum of, of tweets in 100 years from now perish the thought, um, but uh, that, uh, that the, these things that are sort of every day um, uh, might be sort of abstracted out, there's lots of different ways that you'll see writing. You have writing in your, uh, your daily life, so here's a letter. Um, a hand scroll is another context. One of the wonderful things about hand scrolls, and especially uh, one of the reasons they're especially well suited to narrative and to, uh, to writing, is that they're theoretically unlimited. So you could have, as long as you have a big enough roll of paper, you could start writing on, uh, on one end and keep writing as long as you can. So this is particularly well suited um, to, um, uh, to calligraphic representations. But it's not um, a... Uh, it's, it can be used for simply recording something. You have a long text to write. So, you know, 
the sort of my dissertation or something like that. I would write on, you know, something like this. So it has this uh, unli uh, unlimited quality. No one else is going to read it. But it, it can also then become something that um, has a presentation. And then uh, this is, again, why we need to be thinking, uh, especially about sort of physical context. A hand scroll, when you open it up, you open up one part and you close the other part. There's a kind of temporality to it, a, a revelation. And thinking about that is an, uh, another um, thing that is especially um, easy to do, or, or it's, you're more naturally uh, tend to do it in the context of a museum. And just to um, uh, you know, point out other places where you might see uh, writing on uh, ceramics, and of course in, say, modern East Asia, signs. And um, uh, I'm not sure if it's, I don't think they've uh, written it uh, yet, but you could certainly write multiple books on the calligraphy, uh, uh, the, the writing styles and signs and what all these different, um, uh, different styles of writing imply about kind of branding and brand identity. And, you know, that notion of brand identity isn't actually that foreign um, if we're thinking uh, to, to the uh, East Asian context of calligraphy, if we're thinking again about this notion of character and character that someone is branding themselves, is presenting themselves, and they have a series of choices. How you write something. So the content is one thing, but then its uh, particular uh, expression is going to be another. So, well, let's skip McDonald's, but um, if I may, um, uh, you can see that um, these uh, here's um, uh, one restaurant that's using um, uh, a sort of clearly sort of brush model and another one that's uh, doing a more sort of gra uh, graphic model. Each of these are telling you something about how they ex uh, what you're supposed to expect in going in there, how they're presenting themselves. And calligraphers, too, in a, uh, a pre-modern East Asian context, are doing exactly the same thing. They have a series of choices about how to present themselves and they're... <coughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Um, a series of choices about how to present themselves, and uh, then uh, they um, can um, use those choices to give a new, uh, new identity, something that is exciting and different, and um, and perhaps uh, culturally powerful. So, just back to uh, more on the status of writing. Why calligraphy? Well. There's uh, many different reasons, I, I think. Um, I think it is in the hierarchy of values in, uh, in East Asia, at least in China, Korea, and Japan, that calligraphy is generally a, um, a higher ranked art than painting and sculpture and the like. And, um, and part of the reason why I wanted to start um, uh, looking into calligraphy more is I realized there's this enormous body of material and visual production uh, from uh, pre -modern, uh, in the pre-modern context that basically I knew nothing about and I was ignoring. As an art historian, I've been trained in a tradition that's mostly um, uh, um, based in a um, uh, European uh, context, and they're painting, for example, painting, sculpture, architecture. These are the great arts. And calligraphy, with the exception of perhaps the Book of Kells and some other things, is very much at the, at the uh, low end of things. And so this is a, um, uh, so part of the reason to study uh, calligraphy in East Asia is because it is the most important and it's the most ubiquitous. <laughs> Another um, uh, reason to study calligraphy is, it's, uh, is ways it gives you um, insights and entree into other aspects of, uh, of art. In East Asia, um, certainly Islamic art um, includes a great deal of uh, calligraphic representation. So this ring here is uh, writing, right, um, writing as a sort of uh, decorative motif and as a um, sort of uh, con uh, content um, is very important within, uh, uh, within Islamic art. So if you're trying to think about connections you might make, th th there's very little direct sort of visual connections, but in terms of uh, concepts and ways, if you think about walking through a, a museum, how these different pieces connect is quite interesting. What we have here is a, um, uh, another um, uh, Islamic um, uh, 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 piece of calligraphy in the shape of a bird. Or this one I think is particularly interesting. This is by a Chinese-born, excuse me, <coughs> a Chinese-born um, uh, uh, calligrapher um, who's a Muslim, and he's using both um, sort of um, uh, Chinese uh, writing and um, Islamic calligraphy. 
this is a, these uh, pieces like this are a great way to um, make connections across cultures and understand uh, the different ways that, a, um, uh, that writing in general might be important for us. And ideally also for us to reflect on our own use of writing in this world. Everything from sort of commercial uses of writing to um, the disembodied word that we have through computers or say letters and, and greeting cards, things like that. Another reason we might um, uh, be interested in calligraphy is, <coughs> excuse me. Okay, um, is uh, to think about um, connections with say um, uh, 20th, uh, 20th, 21st century art. East Asian calligraphy has been an, um, an exceedingly um, uh, feckin' field for inspiring uh, artists in the Euro-American context. So artists like Mark Toby or Franz Klein uh, are making uh, works um, that either um, explicitly or implicitly are drawing on uh, the aesthetics and ideas of calligraphy. Right, Martin? These are all, of course, in San Francisco. So. These are um, uh, moments where you can see a kind of um, uh, inspiration being drawn from, uh, from East Asia into sort of the mainstream of uh, Euro-American art. Now, why is that important? Well, there's a lot of different reasons why we might want to look at that. But I think the, um, uh, oftentimes when we're thinking of Asian art, there's this sort of fear of derivativeness and anxiety of being basically copy culture, especially um, say a place like Japan that um, many of its, uh, its works come, uh, many of its sort of basic forms seem to come from outside. And, but I think when we look at um, uh, works like this, there's no negative association with, the, um, uh, with one group being inspired by another group. It's not influence. Japanese calligraphers didn't say, okay, we're going to make Bryce Martin um, change um, his, his style, but kind of inspiration. And so this tells you, you know, one of the ways we might think of how, when, other, uh, when cultures interact is that when something seems like a copy, it's often, in a, um, uh, it's often drawing inspiration. It's often a creative act. And certainly within calligraphy, which is exceedingly, um, uh, which is very much um, a, a copying tradition, that copying as a creative act or um, emulating it as a creative act is something, uh, certainly something that we can see easily in this context. And then um, some work like this might go back and inspire a Japanese calligrapher like Ishikawa Kyuyo, who does these incredible uh, um, images of uh, the tale of Genji, a, um, uh, an, uh, a, um, a 10th century, uh, I'm sorry, 11th century uh, <coughs> Japanese uh, uh, work. And this is technically calligraphy. He's thinking about characters as he's doing this, but he's also obviously thinking, about people like Klein and Martin. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. So um, before we dive into more um, uh, specific examples, I'd like to talk a little bit about scripts and styles. Now, this is perhaps a bit more um, detail than you'd like. I, uh, on your handouts, I included um, a sort of summary of this. I don't expect you to get all the details of this, but I want you to um, uh, realize the <coughs> kind of um, range of uh, possibilities that, a, um, uh, that an artist, uh, that a calligrapher um, has at their disposal when they're, uh, when they're, draw uh, when they're um, just making marks on a page. It's very difficult, in fact, probably impossible, to make an innocent mark where you're just simply writing. Even if, for example, you were to type out on uh, your computer as uh, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog, you would, <coughs> excuse me, um, you would have a, um, uh, you, you would have to choose, do you do it in Times New Roman or Caligri or Ariel or something like that or Helvetica, these different, uh, different fonts, that there's a choice that's there. Now your audience may not really care about those uh, distinctions, but certainly in the Asian context, which script, which style you use, was of paramount importance. And so in order to understand that, we have to understand a little bit the uh, history and development of writing in East Asia. So I'll come back to this uh, um, uh, chart um, uh, several times, but we're going to start back in about 1500 BC, um, the uh, very early Shang, uh, um, Shang Dynasty. Now, <clears throat> there's a lot of older writing systems in the world, 
but um, the Chinese writing system is the one that's um, the, been in the most continuous use uh, since, what, uh, essentially 14, uh, 1500, uh, 1400 BCE to the present day. So we can look at things that were made uh, you know, around that time, so um, uh, 3,500 years ago, that are still readable uh, and cer certainly have a direct um, lineal connection to the way that you're writing uh, now. And that's a really astounding thing. And this is part of the reason why is in our historical tradition, it's so much, um, uh, there, there's so much dialogue with the past and other contexts. Now, the earliest writing uh, was on um, orocavones and tortoise shells, and you can see um, uh, them here, or, um, and uh, usually it would be the um, scapula of, a, um, uh, of an ox, uh, like this one, <coughs> or the plaster on the sort of bottom part of a, uh, a tortoise. And you have these characters, the, these, these glyphs that are scratched into it. Now, if you read modern Chinese or Japanese, um, you, know, you, pr you may not be able to recognize a lot of these, but even if you don't, you might be able to see, for example, um, uh, this character here is um, the sun, the moon. Now, that's... Uh, that actually looks quite, uh, certainly the sun looks quite similar to the way it's written even in the present day, which I think un unto itself is astounding. But it's also a, um, uh, it it's also um, gives you some idea of kind of the pictorial quality of early writing. So here, um, this, sorry, my pointer is not working very well. There, ooh, there we go. This moon here, for example, is very much a, um, uh, looks like a moon. And so what, how do these function? Well, you might scratch onto one of these bones a question like, will it rain today? And so it's, it's a question, a question for the ancestors, and they'd often drill holes into that, put a hot poker in that, it would crack in a certain way, and those cracks were thought to be communication uh, with, uh, with a sort of distant world uh, of the, uh, of the uh, spirit world of the ancestors. So from its foundation, writing has to do um, with religion, um, sort of the unseen world, communication um, <coughs> across worlds, and it also has to do with power. The people who are making these and, and writing these were generally um, the, um, uh, the elite, and that's pretty much true of most of the history of calligraphy as we can tell it. Uh, now, there are, of course, you know, some examples of writing from uh, these lower classes, uh, but certainly in this early stage, this is <coughs> almost exclusively a, uh, an elite art and something that is intimately connected with power and culture. Now, another wonderful thing about the uh, collection here is um, the, um, uh, the Brundage collection of bronzes. So Avery Brundage um, uh, uh, has uh, amassed one of the most important uh, collections of these uh, bronzes from the Shang and Zhou uh, periods. And it's one of the highlights of the uh, collection here. So if you were to walk through the, um, uh, the gallery and look at some of these bronzes, <coughs> you may not notice it at the first when you're looking, say, at a, a piece like this. <coughs> But um, right here, for example, is um, some writing, and uh, it may look a lot like, I think I'll use this instead. Oh, I guess it's not going to work. Um, it may look a lot like, um, uh, actually, a skein of fish. You can see three fish uh, uh, hung up there. It may not look like writing, but this early pictorial quality is certainly clear there. You have here, uh, with this, um, uh, these uh, glyphs here, seem to be markings of ownership, uh, probably uh, maybe uh, perhaps a name, something like a, a crest here. <coughs> but if you don't read any uh, Chinese yet, um, you might have uh, some success in reading these characters. Now these are um, uh, just on the edge of servitorial characters, but certainly, anyone want to try? We have horse, elephant, and probably leopard, right? They look like what they are. Now, <clears throat> it's a mistake to think that Chinese writing is pictorial. Uh, this is often something that people who don't have much connection to, um, uh, to or haven't studied Chinese may think, that it's all basically pictures. It's true that a significant portion of the early uh, works were pictorial. These, these are exceedingly pictorial, but you know, here you can see so, uh, like a uh, general idea of how you get from something like tree 
and that gets stylized, and you can see the modern character in the third, um, uh, in, in the third column there. Or we've already seen um, uh, Sun, Sun turning into uh, this sort of squared off character. So there are a significant number of characters um, that are, um, uh, are pictorial, meaning they're, they're based on pictures and they're kind of stylized version of that picture. But they're in the minority. And you can already see the, the problem with it, uh, or the, the challenge. So sun and moon, you can figure out ways that you might imagine a, uh, sort of a picture of that. But how would you do, the, uh, how would you do bright, for example? Bright would be um, uh, much more difficult, and so they combine the characteristics for sun and moon and get this notion of bright. So it's a pretty interesting um, uh, way that very quickly on, um, it starts to um, become non-pictorial or more conceptual and often phonetic as well, and that's, um, uh, that's the vast majority of the characters. And if you look at, say, um, later pieces, say this um, uh, Joe bronze here, you can see the, uh, the writing um, uh, that's uh, written here. And perhaps this character, um, the, uh, this, sorry, my pointer is not working very well, but this character here may look like a child or a human figure or something like that. But the one below it is a little harder to see. And in fact, that's actually supposed to be a crossroads. Uh, and the, uh, the mono character would be this, to go or to move or something like that. So there's a, um, a, a strong sort of conceptual quality to it. And one of the tricky things in thinking about the later history of uh, calligraphy in East Asia <coughs> is that that pictorial quality, in a sense, I would argue, never completely disappears. Now, when we look at the letter A, which is, a, I think, uh, the Phoenician character looks like this, was originally upside down like this, and I believe it's a, um, uh, it was based on an image of a cow uh, with the two horns there. No one in this room looks at the letter A and thinks of the cow. And I think for most of uh, East Asian history, people aren't looking at characters and thinking, oh, this must be, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm imagining a dog or a, uh, a, a son or something like that. But that still has an aspect of it. And I'll show you some good examples of where that pictorial quality keeps being brought back in by calligraphers in, uh, in, uh, in later times. Now, <clears throat> You get more and more elaborate um, uh, inscriptions as time goes on. And this kind of writing um, is, uh, becomes a, an important point even in later, um, uh, later art. So here's another Yeh Family Collection um, uh, piece uh, where the artist here is writing out characters. And you can see it. <coughs> um, you can see the old style characters with the new style characters below. These don't disappear. So remember, we're talking about piece, um, uh, work that was done 1400 BC, 1000 BC, a city a long time ago. Here's a piece from the 19th century, and they're still using this. The past never quite dies. Um, there, there's always a, and in fact, the, quite the opposite is true, that there's accumulation of the past so that there's layers upon layers upon layers. And one of the challenges of later artists is how to break beyond the past and do something new. This style of writing that's on uh, the bronzes um, is called uh, seal script um, because of the, uh, 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 seals I'll show you in a moment. Um, and <coughs> lesser seal script, or this uh, slightly more stylized version of it, is something that you see um, developed by about the end of the third century, around 221, with the uh, founding of the Qin Dynasty. And essentially, you had about a thousand years of people willy-nilly trying different systems and kind of a systemization of certain glyphs that start to have common meaning across, uh, uh, across you know, geography and time. And then a stylization like that. And where we mostly see, and the reason that it's called um, uh, seals, um, uh, or uh, seal script, is because it's still used in, um, sorry, I don't have, let's see. Uh, it's still used in these, you can see these red pieces. These are the seals that are kind of like signatures or collection um, uh, markers. And why would they use something from such an old time? Well, in the same way that in old books you might say, you know, see someone sort of, um, uh, you know, the colophon or someone's, uh, uh, the owner might have a, um, uh, a fancy uh, sort of uh, piece of paper that they paste in there. It gives a kind of quality of the past, a quality of, of um, uh, sort of the unchanging style. This uh, writing system is, often off, is also often used in East Asian uh, money. Why would you do that? Well, you want something to give the impression that things never change, that they're, um, uh, they're set, and they're, um, and they're kind of a powerful connection to this unchanging past. And of course, the past is always in flux. Now, <coughs> 
This is interesting to think about um, when, you, uh, when you think about when some would say in the uh, 20th century, for example, is using SEAL script. They're inspired by this past. They're making this connection of thousands of years back into the past. And, but how did you make um, uh, the, um, the uh, marks on, say, bronzes or on uh, oracle bones? Oracle bones used a sharp uh, stylus, and you'd scratch it in. Uh, with the bronzes, you'd be good into clay, which would be part of the mold. But still, you're using a, 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 a sharp object, a sort of uh, inflexible object that would sort of um, uh, cut, into the, uh, cut into the work. That's quite different when, when you're using ink. And what we'll see is this, these earlier, um, uh, these seal, seal script styles, uh, that'd be associated with the first two there, uh, first three there, four, I'm sorry, um, then give way to another style that's quite different. <clears throat> now, this is the clerical or so scribe script. Now, clerical script is um, uh, not cleric like as in a, um, a monk or a priest or something like that, but a clerk. Um, so this was a script that was initially sort of promulgated and used primarily among, um, say, bureaucrats or people who were trying to write things down. I mean, especially seen from the third century on. It tends to be quite um, symmetrical or uh, as symmetrical as possible. It's much closer to um, sort of modern standard forms of writing so that seal scripts are often quite difficult for people to read. Um, clerical script is usually much easier. And you can see something uh, quite important, for example, in here. You can reverse engineer when you look at a lot of objects. That you don't uh, that by looking at the way it looks today, you can often guess how it was made. So how is this made? Well, certainly not with a stylus, not some um, sort of fixed uh, uh, piece that was ground in. You could probably do something like this, but. What we know is that around this time, we have the development of the flexible brush. Now, these are modern brushes, but give you some sense of what it would look like. <coughs> Bits of uh, a, a sort of a, um, uh, pieces of hair that are bound together in a um, uh, long, um, uh, in, uh, onto a hard shaft like this. That flexible brush is absolutely essential for the sort of uh, later development of calligraphy in East Asia. And so, what does that mean? Well, you, and I, I hope that all of you get the uh, opportunity sometime to try using one of these brushes, because it's completely different than using a ballpoint pen or a, um, uh, a quill or uh, a fountain pen, because you have not only the kind of two dimensions, left and right, up and down, and you have maybe a little bit of that with a fountain pen, uh, a, a little uh, bit more with a fountain pen in terms of depth, but with a flexible brush, you have the, um, uh, the vertical as well. So it becomes a three-dimensional art, something that can go quite into, it, um, into the paper. And so in order to make a line like this here, right here, you start out light uh, with light pressure, and you increase the pressure. This is not done by sort of making this outline, but simply by pressing down harder, and more of that brush goes down. Well, that opens up a whole um, range of possibilities, and <coughs> You can choose many different types of brushes, goat hair brushes, wolf's hair brushes, things like that, all with different effects. And combined with ink, and initially writing on bamboo slips, but again, around the um, uh, uh, third, uh, second, third century, we start to have the widespread use of paper. And these are all the sort of pieces that are uh, together that this is one of the ways that when you're thinking about why something looks the way it does, you can think of the material. And again, something that uh, works particularly well in the museum. You look at that and you think, well, what could you do with something in bronze? Or what could you do with something on paper? And just to give you a sense of what this looks like, here's um, a thousand character essay in clerical script. Uh, and you can see this balanced form, these big sweeping strokes. <coughs> And when it's all together, this, this uh, wonderful sense of regularity, um, but of individual visual interest. Same thing with pieces like this. So, <laughs> this is calligraphy, sort of beautiful, uh, beautiful writing. There's also a sort of non calligraphic version of this, if you will. Uh, remember, uh, many of the people uh, working uh, with this were, were uh, record keepers, people working in a sort of government context. 
And so working a lot like a stenographer or uh, using shorthand. And uh, similarly, you start to get a more cursive style of writing that comes around this time. So <clears throat> just to um, move on, and I, I, I am aware of the uh, break coming up, um, but I just wanted to uh, finish up this uh, sort of basic overview. Around the, um, uh, say, um, starting the third century BC, but really um, you can say about the third century CE, um, you start to develop a kind of running script. This is similar to um, uh, the most sort of cursive style, but this is simply characters that are written in a more fluid way, taking much more advantage of the, um, uh, the effects and power of a flexible brush. Look at how much sort of visual, visual interest is um, uh, suggested uh, in these, uh, these strokes. And so when you see a large, um, uh, a sort of longer piece like this, it's, a, it's still quite readable, um, but in the way that, you know, when you're writing on a government form, you're supposed to print, right? Um, but when you write a letter, generally speaking, assuming people still remember how to do cursive, um, you know, you write in cursive. And, and that cursive is going to be, uh, especially as you get older or more sort of, uh, um, uh, more sort of expressing your personality, that cursive is going to have a lot of difference. And so this is a semi-cursive style that really is quite distinctive. And it's hard to imagine anyone else, except for, for, for in this case, Wang Duo, uh, making the same, um, uh, same, um, uh, types of forms, even though it's readable. So it, it, it strikes a, a, a wonderful balance between legibility, and for most of its history, calligraphy is always about legibility, and um, kind of fluidity and expressing that, that person and that sort of beauty of the individual characters. And you can see that too in, in somewhere like this, where <coughs> some of the characters are connected, I think I'm out of batteries. Um, some of the characters are connected, and there's a kind of wonderful um, uh, sort of uh, way that this gives you a real sense of uh, the artist's um, love of that brush and uh, that, uh, that rhythm and movement. So going down, um, and we're just looking over here at the uh, running script. <coughs> two more scripts just to talk about. And again, what I'm trying to do here is give you some sense of the sort of possibilities that when an artist puts, pen, uh, puts brush to paper, the kind of um, uh, choices that he or she would have to make is so-called grass script or running script. And this is like a full cursive. And I don't know if you can see it, but um, in each of these boxes is the um, uh, standard form of the character, and below it is its um, abbreviated form. And it's quite difficult, and unless you're trained, even if you're completely fluent in, say, ch uh, Chinese, it's quite difficult to, uh, to read this without some uh, special, um, uh, special training, because it's a whole series of conventions. And so here's a, um, uh, a piece uh, uh, in, our collection, uh, in the collection here um, that is in cursive script, and what do you see here? Well, even if you can't read Chinese, I think you can see that legibility becomes much less important here. This is less, um, this is not uh, primarily about communicating a um, uh, set information uh, to someone. And it's very quirky and personal. See these um, uh, lines like this here and this here. These aren't meaningful characters, but if you think again about, say, song or something like that, where melosomata in a kind of um, uh, a uh, sort of musical composition, you might extend a certain um, uh, syllable over a long period. I promise you I won't try and sing. Um, uh, but uh, can, so you can see sort of the ways that the artist is really um, enjoying and playing uh, with this, um, uh, this creation. And just like, you know, going back to poetry, poetry has very intimate links, you know, uh, spoken poetry has intimate links to song and music. I think when we were starting to talk about this more calligraphic, um, uh, more um, uh, sort of cursive style, I think the metaphor is that we might turn to, if you were called upon to stand in front of this and say something about it, is our musical metaphors. Rhythm and tone and um, timbre and all these um, uh, these um, terms that we might borrow from uh, from musical terminology to describe what's going on here. It's not, it, it, and it's just like um, uh, kind of music as. as uh, contemporary music that might have more or less interest in the words, uh, and sometimes it's simply um, just the expression. And so these different pieces um, become more and more sort of expressive. This is so-called wild cursive, and wild cursive is, you know, again, there's no hard and fast lines, but there's almost a sort of complete 
loss of, you know, unless you're a, you're a specialist, this would be very difficult to read even one or two characters within this. And so what does this do when you take away meaning, uh, when you take away sort of um, obvious sort of functionality as writing? Well, just like the frame of the mounting, it makes you look at the characters. It makes you uh, enter into um, these, these pieces. And to really pay attention to the kind of ways that these, uh, uh, these characters are being formed. And also, going back to this notion of an everyday art, because most people looking at these, uh, these works would have, on a regular basis, held a brush in their hand and made marks on a page in a, in a similar way, that there's also a performative aspect to this. That when you're looking at this, you're, you're often, you even see people doing this, but you're conceptually sort of moving through these lines, rhythm, and in a sense, entraining yourself with the original calligrapher. And that's one of the great powers of uh, uh, calligraphy in this context. Now let me um, uh, just uh, finish this up and uh, talk about uh, the final script. And this is strange because the uh, final script I want to talk about is block or sa standard script, which really is, in a sense, the latest development, so fourth or fifth century CE. And if you read um, uh, uh, Chinese characters, this would be um, uh, quite familiar to you. Um, even if you don't know the specific meaning of each one, you'd be able to look it up in a dictionary. They're quite, uh, quite legible in exactly the way that that's a wild cursive isn't. And the, um, uh, this um, standard block regular script, there's different uh, uh, readings for it, it's used in um, sublime um, uh, sort of uh, uh, ways in uh, pieces like this. The, um, uh, this is Zhao Meng Fu's uh, great masterpiece of the, um, uh, of the Lotus Sutra. And you can see kind of the regularity of it. It's a, this is a scripture, a Buddhist scripture. And it's theoretically, it's supposed to be communicating information, communicating um, uh, the sort of content of the Buddha's words. But it combines some of that modulated line of the clerical script with some of the movement and uh, vitality of uh, the sort of more cursive scripts to be something that becomes a standard for uh, essentially um, 1,500 years uh, uh, beyond and to the present day. So <clears throat> when we're writing, we have all these different styles um, that we can, uh, we can work. And this is somewhat similar if you think of Looking around here, um, you know, you have um, uh, the uh, Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian columns. Why are Ionic columns being used here? There's a choice there. These are kind of different modes that tell you something about the kind of persona, the, uh, the image that someone, say, designing this hall or making a work of calligraphy like this would have wanted to, uh, to do. And this is somewhat similar to um, uh, fonts. Um, we can uh, think about you know, the different ways, some people have very strong opinions about fonts, some less so, but about how each of these fonts might tell you something. And you can do this with uh, East Asia or, you know, looking at the fonts, um, oh, where did I see it? Oh, here, um, uh, the Society for Asian Art font. You know, what are these uh, different, uh, different choices, different presentations of self? And so an artist in the present day um, has all these different scripts just alone um, to, uh, to draw on. And so there's many ways to write tiger, these seal scripts, and uh, clerical scripts, a um, more cursive style, all these different ways. And each of these is something that tells you about how the person wants to be perceived and how they're relating to the past. So in the latter uh, part of uh, um, uh, my talk, I want to uh, show you some concrete examples of that, uh, but um, I think it is time for a 10-minute break.